When I was in the mental institution, I met this man who could predict what the TV was going to say. And um, I asked him if I liked the future, and he told me I was going to hate it. Something about old PlayStation games is scary. Whether it's due to the low poly graphics, the sound design, or our sense of nostalgia being interrupted by this new element of horror. This is a sentiment shared by many horror game enthusiasts. So much so, that in 2018, the haunted PS1 was established, a compilation of old PS styled horror games made by a variety of creators. The first disc was made in 2020, containing the demos for 13 games and the full versions of 4 games. What I've gathered today are a few games and demos from the 2020 disc, the 2021 disc, and some independent games of a similar style. So sit back and relax, because this is the Haunted PS1. The first demo I have to present to you is Walk, a third person game where you find yourself walking around a Japanese neighborhood at night. Despite the haunting atmosphere, nothing seems wrong at first glance. The scariest part of the game is just turning a corner without knowing what's on the other side, on account of the third person camera angles. This game really is aptly named Walk. The premise of walk, fortunately, is not just walking. The entire time you are being stalked by a tall, shadowy figure with a white face, only knowing when it's close due to the text on screen and the sharp, echoey sounds it emits, immediately fading away when it turns a corner into a new location. In the same parking lot where we first encountered the shadowy figure, we're able to pick up a 100 yen coin off the ground. Going in the direction from which the figure came brings us to a dead end with only a single vending machine. There we can buy a key for 200 yen. Now it's just a matter of finding the remaining 100 so that we can purchase the key, though who knows what door it opens. The only other way to go is around the corner to the left of the parking lot the same place we last saw the monster. However, as soon as we approach the corner, so does it. Luckily, the final 100 yen is waiting for us to pick up at the end of this long alleyway. Unluckily, the fact that this is a straight shot alley makes our situation a bit perilous at times. Thank you. 
At this point, I realized that the monster had seen me and began walking my way. So I ran over to the vending machine, bought the key, and made my way back over to the locked gates I had walked by just minutes prior. Upon entering the gate, we're met with another alleyway with nowhere to hide, except this time, the camera is following us. As text appears on screen, and the monster's shadow fades in, it's quickly apparent that it's not the camera that's following us, but the monster. We are seeing ourselves run away through the monster's eyes. The final location of the demo is a single room, in a single house, with only a TV, flashing the same text and images over and over. At this point, there's only one way to go, and that's back through the front door, not knowing what might possibly be on the other side. That is where the demo ends for Walk. I decided to have Walk be the opener for this video due to it being one of my personal favorites from this list of haunted PS1 games. The use of real photos for the environment and interactions made this game all the scarier as I felt like I was watching real life footage. I had watched gameplay of Walk before filming and I wasn't able to appreciate the fixed camera angles until I played it for myself. The point of the fixed angles isn't to make movement more difficult but rather to make it more horrifying when you walk blindly into a new location, or when you're unsure of where the monster is and whether or not it can see you. The sudden switch to the monster's point of view at the most terrifying moment really completes the game, by giving the player the exact opposite of the angles they were just starting to get used to. Not to mention the ending, forcing the player to walk outside and confront the monster, even having the main character shake her head, knowing well what will happen if you go outside. I have no idea when a full version of this game will drop, or if it ever will, but I highly suggest you play the demo for yourself. Agony of a Dying MMO is a demo I played on a whim, with no prior knowledge of what the game is about. As for why exactly I decided to play it, I couldn't tell you, but I'm glad that I did. Agony of a Dying MMO is less of a game than it is an interactive experience. The basic premise is this. Your favorite MMO that has been running for over two decades now is shutting down, and you, along with many other players, hop online to experience a game one last time. What follows is a slew of players sharing with each other their emotions, stories, memories, and how they plan on spending their final moments. The players in this game are representative of the many different types of people you'd encounter online, with a heavy emphasis on those from the darker and more distressing areas. Without any knowledge of who we are, 
or what we hope to achieve in these final hours, we are dropped directly into the game, surrounded by those mourning the impending loss of their favorite MMO, stating their regrets, and trying to connect with friends one last time. Uh, have any MP5 ammo? Yes, I have extra. Here, extra. As the beginning of the game starts by flashing through different areas, it's possible that we are experiencing multiple points of view, making it hard to distinguish who we really are. The first meaningful bit of dialogue comes from a user named Shadow Scream Z, who mentions a user named Adam, and how strange things happen once the player reaches level 99. At this point, we're left to freely roam the foggy landscape, running into players who are both enjoying their final time together. This area is off limits, so fuck off. <laughs> and those who are a bit more on edge. He's not here. I've searched everywhere. As we enter the next area, we get a bit more information on this Adam character, learning that he's not an actual player, but an NPC. It would make sense that had you spent many years searching for something, you'd want to at least finish your search in the final moments of the game, which is why many players are making it their final goal to find Adam, something that we'll see more of at the end of this demo. At this point in time, even the NPCs are acting strange, acknowledging that this is the end of the world for them, and that their lives will soon come to an end. The game progresses, and we continue to traverse the, at times, vibrant and surreal landscape. For the most part, the players seem to be enjoying themselves, and everything starts to seem a little less worse than we had made it out to be, until the player gets transported in front of this large red and black building. What we have just entered is a church dedicated to Yucca87, an active player for 11 years who ended up committing a mass. This is not a space created by the players, but rather by the developers of the game, as these aren't other players we're talking to, but NPCs. Above them all hangs a crucified body whom all the NPC models are based around, which could very well be Yucca87's old player model. This part of the game disturbed me, knowing that the developers encourage this act of violence, and that the community on for the game's final moments is equally full of hate. It was uh, New Year's Eve, and um, I was really hungry, and uh, when I hung myself in the bathroom, something came in the room. Um, it sounded like at first the emergency alert signal in the other room, and then some horrible crying like a dying animal. The latter half of the game consists of a car ride between us and another player. As we don't know who we are, it's hard to tell whether we are the one talking or if it's the other person in the car. Nevertheless, the user named Flower Power recounts several of their bad experiences 
over the past few years. The other user in the car, Vivianus, comforts Flower Power, but at the same time, tells them that they can't blame everything on reaching level 99, a reference to the level 99 curse that has been mentioned multiple times throughout the game. I definitely feel for you. These last few years sound like they were really hard for you, but you can't just blame it all on reaching level 99. You're gonna have to make peace with the fact that we probably will never find Adam. I mean, a lot of players thought that finding Adam would give them ultimate power in the game, and other players like you think it's a way to stop what they consider a curse, but it's just a psychosis. Adam was just a rumor, nothing more. We wasted our time. When I, uh, when I was in the mental- In order to break the curse, Flower Power and Vivianus have been searching for Adam, albeit unsuccessfully. As both players get out of the car, we can see that Vivianus is who our player was talking to, meaning that we are Flower Power. We are the one experiencing all these terrible things due to the level 99 curse, and we have spent many years of our life searching for Adam. In the final scene of the game, we play as a character named Badger98 surrounded by other players in our faction, all preparing to do the Blood Raid, an endgame activity and also our last chance to find Adam. However, as we fly off to our landing zones... What's your two, buddy? What the- Why is everyone getting banned? What the f*** is going on? Whoa. Almost all players get banned. That's where the demo ends. I'm glad that I happened upon this game because I enjoyed the story. Agony of a Dying MMO is very well made. It's a good recreation of an end of the world scenario. Some players are happy, some players are sad, some are breaking down, and some are going about business like usual. Like I said in the beginning, many different corners of the internet are well represented by the players you encounter in this MMO. I felt like I was actually playing a niche little game with its own subsection communities, comprised of both good, but mainly bad players. The dialogue, the voice acting, and even the chat box make this game feel like it's so full of life, not just regular NPCs. I really hope that Agony of a Dying MMO releases a full version someday, as I'd like to play through it for myself. But until then, this is all we're left with. After being forced to take an elevator, we are dropped in the middle of an ordinary office building with no background knowledge or explanation. This is Zimzum, and for how simple of a game it is, it's incredibly well made. As we make our way around this floor, we find out that literally nothing is amiss. There's nothing strange going on, and not much for us to interact with. Every door is either locked, or leads to nothing, forcing us to go back to where we started. The elevator takes us to another floor with the exact same layout, and again, nothing seems to be happening.
As we walk by the windows, we can hear a faint tapping on the glass. This strange occurrence helped me to realize that this floor is not exactly the same as the last. It's messier, darker, and everything just seems out of place. With only one way to go, we make our way back to the elevator to head to the next floor. It should be painfully clear by now, but something is wrong. Besides the obvious points, such as the lights being out, and the seemingly endless men's bathroom, the office has lost almost all of its ambience, making it easier to hear each of our echoing footsteps. And whatever's happening outside. This version of the floor is borderline trashed compared to the very first floor. File cabinets are strewn about. This normally full office is missing all but a chair and a computer, and a cubicle's radio is emitting a strange broadcast. In addition, strange copper wires have started lining the walls, which we briefly saw on the previous floor. This must mean that we're going down, and the deeper we go, the worse it gets. Armed with this knowledge, there's only one way to go. The usual door to the main office area is missing, so instead we opt for the bathroom route. This time, it's not infinite, but rather a narrow hallway, filled with the aforementioned copper pipes. Something is lurking within this office and it appears to be a worm-like creature, judging by the tunnels we've been seeing scattered around. And, as the sound suggests, it's moving through the walls. Heading back through the hallway, we again make our way to the elevator as our journey nears an end. While every floor before this has been a similar and sometimes distorted version of the others, it appears that we finally made our way to the basement as this level is nothing like the previous ones. Instead, this one is filled with grotesque, many-legged creatures, emitting sounds similar to what we heard outside the window. For once, the elevator is not an elevator, but rather a door to our final destination. We're finally back. Although this floor is a slightly different variation of the first, it's still the office we remember, and it's nice to get away from whatever was going on. But something is off.
for the final scene, we're greeted by what we encountered in the office a few floors back. A massive, bloodied worm with a human head that's capable of speech. And, judging by the dialogue, I can't say this ends well for us. What Zimzum does, it does very well. The atmosphere, the directional sound, the slight change in each level to give you a sense of what's going on while also leaving you wondering what you might encounter next are a few things that make Zimzum an enjoyable experience. From the get-go, you know something is off, that you're not alone, but there's no escape. Every exit is locked, some hallways are flat out infinite, and there's only one single way to progress through the game. The elevator. Knowing this, you can either try and locate the elevator as quickly as possible, or enjoy your final moments wandering this infinite office space. Both options leading to your demise. Filth Breed is a game where we take on the role of a police officer investigating a local cult located in this rundown, disgusting building. As we make our way down the hallway into the first room, we can find a note on the table that reads the following. You were right, Sally. We should never have trusted these crazy f- They keep us all down here in the dark, trapped like cattle. We're just animals to them. Some of us are even starting to act the part. There's this Lucas guy who walks on all fours and bites you when you're sleeping. I miss you, Sally. I miss the gang back home. I miss Brightmore. I hear them chanting again. It's time. As we pick up the gun, something attacks us. At this point, any doubts about what's going on inside the building can be put to rest, because there is definitely something going on. What attacked us doesn't even look human anymore, but rather, a shell with no eyes, no mouth, and no skin. Just a hard outer layer. Making our way through the building, and taking out another one of those strange humanoids, we find a poem, again from someone we can assume was being held captive here. Every time I wake up, there are roaches in my mouth. Are they getting in? Are they coming out? Every time I wake up, there are roaches in my mouth. I can't take it. The humanoid creatures we keep killing seem to be making these disgusting squirming sounds with each step, almost as if they're filled with bugs. Perhaps these are previous members of the cult, who have been infested and transformed into these inhuman entities. A previous note suggests that this is the case, as whoever's writing the note is losing their vision, similar to the humanoids with no eyes. The note also references the sounds of numerous hands and feet crawling all over which could be a reference to the bug infestation.
Thus spoke the slumbering prophet Gorgorum. It took a sick god to imagine a world this filthy. It took a vile god to shape a world this cruel. It takes a world this filthy to shelter us all in its putrid bosom. It takes a world this cruel to nurture us all into an existence of agony. We are but mold on a rotting apple. We are but the shadows of a madman's dance in the fire. Man is not doomed, but destined to ruin. Man is not to purge, but to fester the world. Which innards reveal this path? Bring forth the lice mother. What we find on the second floor is a strange book written in an unfamiliar language, in a room that's akin to a space of worship. Not far away from that, we find religious ramblings mentioning a prophet named Gorgorum, God, and the Lice Mother, possibly referencing the contents of the religious book. Immediately after, we find the body of a man, spilling open and filled to the brim with bugs. Right next to him is a hole, also filled with bugs, and some sort of substance covering the ground. I'm not exactly sure what these round things are, but to me, they look like eggs. Eggs larger than any normal bug could lay. Opening the shutter and leaving the bug infested part of this building will bring us back to where we started. And all we can do now is leave. Filthbreed has three endings. Going through the entire building as I did prompts the third ending, while leaving the building as soon as the game starts prompts the first ending. To get the second ending, you must exit right after killing your first humanoid, prompting what's possibly the worst result, which is other officers taking on your case. Filthbreed is undeniably short, as it took me only a few minutes to get all three endings, but that doesn't mean it's a bad game. I like how disgusting everything is in Filthbreed, and the way the game feeds us just enough information to know that something is up, but not to know exactly what's going on. Whether this be through the scattered notes of people long dead, the illegible religious text, or the fact that we burned down the entire building at the end, leaving no more room for investigation. Filthbreed absolutely succeeds at what it's trying to accomplish. Our final game is misleading, to say the least. The game's titled Graveyard Shift, but we're actually just working at a small grocery store. For the first part, Graveyard Shift is comprised of the players stacking boxes at the front door in preparation for a delivery truck which will be arriving in a few hours. 
It took me a while to locate them all, but placing the final box at the front door prompts this slight noise. Which our character attributes to something falling over in the storage room. So we go to check it out. Gus, someone who was mentioned at the beginning of the game, has now gone missing, and it's up to us to find him. We can assume that the situation is fairly dire due to the message being written out in blood. So, with no time to spare, we attempt to call him, only to find out that the line has been cut. Strange enough, since the phone was working perfectly fine at the start of the game. As there's only one place left to explore, we make our way to the back alley, a sharp contrast to the colorful and music-filled grocery store. According to this man in the sleeping bag, something is alive, and soon enough, it's going to consume everything. A possible hint at what might have happened to Gus. As any normal person would, I didn't give the man any money, but had I, he would have said this. With that in mind, we continue to patrol the alleyway until coming across a pothole, and with no other option we go into the sewers. After wandering around the sewers for 7 minutes, I finally found an unfamiliar hallway, leading me to my final destination for tonight. A giant, gurgling mass of bodies hidden deep in the sewers, and as we can see many bodies in a similar fashion on the title screen, this is exactly right. What I had assumed to be some sort of monster, based on the man telling me it was going to consume everything, was, in reality, a conglomerate of bodies that Gus had most likely not been simply devoured by, but added to. I like the graveyard shift. I like the sudden switch in tones between inside the grocery store and outside. I like the subversion of expectation, and I like the sound design, which keeps me immersed in the game. Getting lost in the sewers was indeed frustrating, but that's the price I have to pay for the experience. I like games that keep me on edge, and I definitely was the further it progressed. Good work. From terrifying, to tragic, from scary, to silly, 
there's just something about old PlayStation style graphics that makes everything a bit more horrifying than normal. There were a few times that I was genuinely a bit frightened. Playing with the lights off definitely didn't help. So those were just a few PS1 style horror games that I enjoyed playing and wanted to share with all of you. And that's just a fraction of what's on the Haunted PS1 demo discs. I'll leave links to all the games, including links to the Haunted PS1 demo discs, in the description, so that you all can experience them for yourself. But that's all for me. As always, thank you for watching, and good night.